We are in Genesis chapter 3. We are working through uh, the early part of Genesis, and this is the saddest of Genesis. This is the saddest uh, event in human history, the fall of humanity, the fall from grace, original sin. Where did it all start? Where did it come from? And the question we're answering today is, what's the matter with us? I almost said, what's the matter with you? But uh, I, I have to be part of this, right? There, none of us are excluded in this broken world that we, we find ourselves in. But it started in a place that was very good, where everything was good. There was no brokenness. There was no war. There was no disease. There was no death. There was also no lying to your parents or spouse There was no taking advantage of a situation at work or doing something because of your neighbor that you don't want them to know you just did. So it's the big things we think about that are bad in our world, but it's also the things that are happening in us and through us that are also bad. All of these things come from the same source, and that is sin that was introduced through a decision that started with deception and temptation and led to a world we live in that is that has fallen from grace until God changes it and makes it all new okay now let's not lose sight of that there is hope and that this will this is changing it has changed and it's going to change further um, the best is yet to come um, but Right now, we're kind of in that period of time where the kingdom of God is here, but not fully. And so I'm looking forward to that, and I hope you are as well. But let's let's see where this this comes from. I I have a a piece of fruit up here. I I did choose an apple, even though we don't know what fruit was in the garden that Eve took from the tree. Um, But this is the traditional, and so um, this is just kind of a reminder that something as innocent as an apple or whatever fruit, uh, can be a part of something that's dreadful. Um, but it's not the apple, the piece of fruit. It's not, that, it's, not its fault. It's, it's us. It's the decision of how we choose to respond to our circumstances and the temptations that come our way. We're going to talk a lot about temptation and making decisions that lead to sin. Let me make one clarification. Temptation is not wrong. We are all tempted. Jesus was tempted. Sin occurs when we give in to that temptation, okay? But not just outwardly, though that is pretty obvious, but even inwardly. When we respond and give in to sin through a decision, through a, a thinking, uh, even through, and, and, and really at a heart level, that's when sin begins to get its grip on us and we cross a line that gets us into a bad place, okay? This is why Jesus says things like, You've heard it said, thou shalt not murder, but I tell you, if you hate your brother, you've committed the sin of murder already in your heart. In other words, you've crossed a line in God's eyes that doesn't leave a corpse necessarily, but basically what you're saying when you hate somebody like that is, all I'm missing is the opportunity to follow through on what I want to do. Does that make sense? He does the same thing with with adultery and lust. And, and he basically is making this point, sin is not only measured by the, what we see on the outside, though that is obviously going to be part of it, but it starts here and here. And we're going to see that play out in slow motion, and it's not a pretty sight. So I'm actually going to start reading, and I'm going to refer to a couple of things in chapter 2. I'm going to refer to verse 9. I'm going to refer to verse 16 and verse 25 in chapter 2. But we're going to look at chapter 3 in, in just the first seven verses in detail today. So let me start in 25, 225. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So they, that's the way they feel and are in the world as God created it. He, he created a good world world, and he put two very good people in it, okay? And we talked about that in detail in that marriage relationship and how God instituted that in the garden, and it was all very good. But things are about to change. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made, okay? And, and generally speaking, you and I, we look at snakes, and maybe, unless you're 
one of those that actually likes to hold snakes and things like that. Most of us look at them and we just don't like them. There's just some vibe about them. And that's kind of what is being alluded to here. But this isn't just a serpent. I don't know if this is technically correct, but essentially this serpent is possessed. And Satan is going to speak through this creature to Eve. And I'm going to make the case, though I can't say it's 100%, that Adam is there too. Okay? So uh, it continues. He said to the woman, this is the serpent, this is Satan through the serpent. Oh, and, and just in case you're, you're doubting me on that, let me just, Revelation, I'm just going to read a quick verse. Revelation 12, 9, and it's also in 20, verse 2, where John refers to, um, he refers to the ancient serpent. And he tells us who he is. 12.9 says, The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. And he says essentially the same thing in, in chapter 20, verse 2. The serpent, Satan, one and the same in this case, uh, is practically speaking. And then he starts to speak, this serpent. Now, it's interesting to me that Eve doesn't seem to be bothered by a talking serpent, okay? I think that would bother me, but anyway. So that tells me either it bothers her, but she is everything so new it doesn't matter because she's like, this is just something else new, or all the animals were talking and it was just another animal talking to her. I kind of like that answer. I don't know. I'm just speculating. But uh, let's see what it says. So the serpent said to the woman, which has been... Um, Let's see, she hasn't been named yet, has she? Has she called Eve yet? We're going to call her Eve, but she's still called the woman. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, I'm going to read it like the grammar seems to indicate, okay, which seems to be, it's going to sound surprised, but we know he's not surprised. So mock surprise, but, but she's not going to pick up on the mocking part. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, clearly this isn't correct. Not only did God say not eat from any tree in the garden, but eat from every tree in the garden except for one, which you will we'll see that again. But here's what's happening already, and this is this is pretty key to the whole the whole passage, and that is he is undermining the goodness of God right off the bat. He suggests something that is actually really not good, which is really not true, also. Um, David Helms, in, in his book, uh, The Genesis Factor, says there's really several questions here that are being brought to the surface. One is, is God really good? And it points to the boundaries that God put even in the good creation. God put boundaries. He said, don't eat, don't do something. Uh, second question, um, is God's word trustworthy and authoritative in our lives? In other words, do we actually... If we're followers of God, should we be obeying his word without question? And I don't mean like mindlessly. We think about this, these things and the why. We understand why. But we trust him first, and then we ask the why questions underneath that assumption he's trustworthy. So is God good? Is God's word trustworthy? And, and, the, and Satan's going to undermine that stuff. And the reason I really want to point this out is because this isn't any different than today. We are dealing with the same temptations we are always being tempted to, challenge, to believe whether or not God is really good, right? I mean, think about it. In, in our culture today, um, where we would say as Christians, God has given us the gift of sex to happen within the bounds of marriage, and that's the boundaries that he's set up, okay? That people would say, well, God's given us this gift. If there's a God, he's given us this gift of sex. Who is he to tell us how to use it? Which is such an ironic question. <laughs> well, he's the one that created you and spoke you into existence from nothing. So that, to me, feels like he has a lot of credibility and authority to do that. But nevertheless, people are blind to that and don't see that. So is God good even though they're do these boundaries indicate that God's actually keeping something from us that's good, which is what he's going to imply even further here in a minute. So let's continue. So the woman said to this, uh, I'm sorry, he said, did God, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. So Eve answers correctly. She adds something and she takes something away. 
all right? So the first thing she does is she takes something away. And it's real subtle, and it's not a big deal, but she basically lessens the grace and goodness of God by, by not saying um, what was said earlier. So um, she says, uh, you may eat from any, you may eat, she doesn't say any, you may eat from the tree, the trees in the garden. Go to chapter 2, verse 9. This is what God says to Adam or the narrator. The, God, the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Trees that were, that's not the verse I want. It must be 16. Yeah. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, from any tree. Some of yours probably say every tree. In other words, God has given you a, a not just a grove, but a grove of groves hundreds of square miles potentially of nothing but trees with a variety of fruit and food that is good, pleasing to the eye and good for food. Okay. Now let's just pause there for a second because that doesn't sound real tempting to me. I'm just going to say it now. All right. I will eat occasional apple, but I'm not really drawn to, you know, I like strawberries. There's certain fruit I will eat, but when I have a choice to pick a restaurant, I'm not looking for the fruit bar. I'm just going to say it that way, okay? I want you to imagine with me, just give me a little bit of liberty here. I want you to imagine, I want you to think of who is the person in my life that I trust more than anybody else right now. Just to yourself, think, who do I trust more than anybody in the world? Okay, you got that person? All right, now I want you to th imagine that they just became the most powerful person in America, more powerful than the president. They can get you anything they want. They can do just about anything they want, okay? And they come up to you, and they give you a card, a card that looks like a credit card, and they say, I have a gift for you. This card will allow you to have unlimited access to any restaurant in your city for as long as you live. I wouldn't be so bad, would it? Right? Any restaurant for free I could eat at. All I could eat as often as I want to go. Any restaurant in my city. That'd be, that would now, now you're starting to, okay, okay, not just every tree, but every restaurant. Now we start to kind of begin to see what was offered to them in that good creation. And that's not, that's just one of many of the many blessings that came with creation, but we tend to think through food, so that seemed like an easy one to go to. Okay, so that's where we are when he says, um, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. And then, of course, he continues in verse 16, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will die. But that's all he says. She adds back to uh, uh, verse uh, 3, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And then she adds, and you must not touch it, and then she says, or you will die, which the first and last part, spot on, that middle part, she adds. Now, when I was talking earlier about external sin as opposed to sin that happens in our mind, in our hearts, what she's doing is essentially what the Pharisees were doing in the days of Jesus. They had the laws of God, and then they would add the laws of man around kind of like a picket fence to kind of keep people not even getting close to the laws of God, which sounds good. It's good intentions maybe even. But here's the thing, what it, what it does is it emphasizes the externals. And it's just like, if I just don't do anything outwardly that's sinful, I'm going to look good and I'm going to be okay with God. And, and what I want to caution you in here is God knows what you're thinking. He knows where your heart is. He knows where your affections are. He knows what matters to you most. And even though you may look good on the outside to the casual observer, God knows your heart, and he knows where your mind goes, and it's still sin, okay? And we're going to see that play out here. All right, so he continues. Now Satan, he just gets much more direct. He's just going to outright lie now. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, that part seems to be true, but the very first part, you will certainly not die. Now, um, when he says the words you here, every time he says you, he's actually saying y'all or you too. Because somebody else is there, because the word for you here in the grammar in the Hebrew is plural which means more than one person is being spoken to. Well, who else is there? Well, the only other option is Adam, 
There's only two people on planet Earth at this point, right? Wouldn't a TV series, that'd be an amazing reality show, wouldn't it? All right, so you, um, you all, so it reads like this, verse 4. You, you two will not certainly die, the servant said to the woman, for God knows that when you two eat from it, your eyes will be open and you two will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, that's not 100% lock, okay? It, it's possible that he shows up later. But it, to me, it's pretty convincing. The most convincing part, of course, is that he's eventually there at the end of verse 6 when it says, she also uh, gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. But I'm not there yet, so. All right, so verse, uh, five, uh, verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Let's pause there. All right, I wanna, now I want to go to verse 9 of chapter 2. This is where it's just Adam, and God says to Adam, or the, or this is described, I guess, as by the narrator. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. Okay? And now, now we're talking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's pleasing to the eye and good for food. So it's not like... I'm, it seems to me like it looks just as good as all the other trees for, and all the other fruit. What seems to stand out is there's something here that this, this tree is dangling something that is appealing that the other trees don't have to offer, and that is that if I eat like this, if I eat from this, and this is where he gets to it, that she will gain wisdom that will make her like God. And here's the undermining part. This is the part where it's like you're... She's being tempted to believe that God is not good because he's holding something back. This is what the implication is. So when the woman saw that the fruit, fruit of the, tree, the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both were opened. Um, I'm missing it. Okay, here it is. Verse 5. I, I meant to read it. I'm going to read this again. For God knows that when you eat, this is Satan talking to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, that is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay? And I've always focused on the knowing good and evil part, um, which is significant, um, but this like being like God, I, got, I, I guess because I've grown up knowing that's not possible, that's never been a temptation to me. I never really thought about it. But if you think about being like God, it would be like, it's not unlike, okay, so one of the things I used to do as a, as a middle school boy, I lay in bed at night trying to go to sleep. And so I would begin to imagine, if I couldn't go to sleep, I would begin to imagine what it would be like to be able to be invisible whenever I wanted, right? Kind of like Harry Potter in the clo with the invisible cloak, right? And how cool it would be able to go through and walk through my school and hear what everybody's saying without them knowing I'm there. And just and at home, I could go into my brother's room and mess with stuff, and he would never know I was in there or whatever. Just the, those, those are the kind of things. And now we have superhero movies, and it's like you go to the, we go see these superhero movies. They're so popular. Why is it? I think in part, one of the reasons is we yearn to be like them in, in the sense that they can do things we can't do that would be awesome and amazing to do. I mean, how cool would it be to just be able to jump and fly? I mean, that would be amazing. So this be like God, we don't, we realize I can't be like God. God can, you know, speak the universe into existence with words. And yet we really kind of do go there in all the things that we crave or, or look for and, and wish for. And Eve's no different. Even though she's still without sin, she's still temptable. Jesus was without sin, and he was temptable. It says, Scripture says, he was tempted as we are, yet did not sin. That means he, was, he resisted the temptations that we faced. He just didn't give in to them. So this, he's undermining, again, the goodness of God, and he's undermining with this idea that, that God's word's not trustworthy. That's when he says, you, you will not certainly die. So then the deed happens. Okay, Eve doesn't just break the law of God where she eats. She actually breaks her own version of the law, which is touch. And she, So well, let me read that part again. Um, she took some of it and ate it, some of the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She also gave some to her husband, Adam, who was with her, and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked, and so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. A couple of thoughts. First of all, 
um, this idea of shame and not shame. They were naked before, no shame, and then all of a sudden they were, and the knowledge of good and evil. Let me, I, don't, I don't know if this really captures it, but I'm gonna, I think this helps. It helped me anyway. I, I heard somebody recently talking about a child asking them the question, like a child asking the parent the question, what does it mean when someone puts their middle finger up? Right? What does it mean? And the parent having to deal with that question, right? Why is that child asking that question? Well, the child doesn't know. The child is innocent of the knowledge of what that symbol means. Does that make sense? And then now that they have knowledge, they can't go back to not knowing that. Once you tell them or once they figure it out or once they hear, now they're, it's like their innocence is lessened. Okay? Now that's a, just a hint of what we're talking about on a massive scale when Adam and Eve going from innocent to knowing good and evil and, and, and recognize, because they had no need to know evil if there was none in the world, at least none that they had been confronted with yet. And so, and then the other thought here is, where is Adam? Where is Adam? What's the matter with us could be answered one way is, the matter with us is Adam didn't do his job. God created Adam and then he created Eve. Equal, beautiful, made in the image of God. He made Adam first and, and Eve second. He made Eve from Adam. Okay? These are God's tells of saying to us, there's an order and I have a plan and it's intentional. It's not accidental. It's not up for vote. It's not subject to change. This is how I made it. It's my creation. I made it this way. It works best when you walk in my ways. And when you don't, it hurts. It hurts you and it hurts other people. And that's what sin is. Okay? Adam was supposed to rule over creation. And she was supposed to help him because he can't get the job done like he needs to without her. That's why she's there, to help him. Okay? She's essential for him to be able to do the job well. Okay? He's, I think he's there the whole time. He's watching what's happening. I hope he's not. But I think that the reason this is ripples through even the New Testament where Paul talks about headship of the home is, is because of this. So um, Satan tempts her. He lies to her. Adam's silent. Adam knows. Who, did, who told Adam, don't eat from the tree? God told Adam directly. Who told Eve? We don't know. Either God told her or Adam told her. I think Adam told her because I think that was his job, and God let him do his job or not do his job. He let him do it well or not do it well. It could be that the reason she added that phrase was because he added that phrase, and she's just remembering it perfectly, and he said it wrong. We don't know. But Adam had multiple opportunities to step up and, in a very gentle but strong, loving, protective way, say, we need to leave because he's lying, because God said this, and he's saying that. And that should be all it takes for us to recognize something's not right here. And I don't have to know what's not right to know something's wrong. Because why? I know what's true. God spoke. God said. And it, therefore, if God said it, it's true. Now, it's not usually that simple, is it? There's so much nuance. There's so much messiness. Because we can say, well, I know what he said, but I'm not sure I know what he meant. Because now I'm wondering, because of the deception and the temptation to believe another story, okay? Now, I don't know if you picked up on this. Chapters 1 and 2, God is all over the place. He's doing things. He's speaking. Here we are, and there's no voice. God's gotten, he's, he is silent. He is letting this play out. The only voice we have besides uh, Eve is Satan. And he's speaking, and he's taking advantage of this opportunity, and he is trying to derail them. That is his mission. And so he deceives her, which, and so she sows so seeds of doubt, and she begins to say, what am I going to do with this? And Adam's silent, 
And, and not only does he not say something, but then she moves towards the tree. Clearly, she's going to touch the tree. Well, I don't know if that bothered him or not, but that's going to lead to her taking the piece of fruit and taking a bite. And he doesn't stop her. He doesn't reach over and slap the fruit out of her hand. He doesn't come to his senses. He just stands and watches. And then when he sees her take the bite and, and the, the, the juice is running down her chin, and she's like, this is really good. Her eyes light up because of the, and she turns to him and he's looking at her going, she's not dying. He was right. So when she offers it to him, he receives it and he eats. Now, she was deceived. Scripture tells us this more than once. She was deceived by the serpent, okay? That doesn't mean she wasn't responsible for her actions, but he wasn't deceived. Paul makes this point in the New Testament. He willingly disobeyed, which is why he is the one Scripture holds most responsible. The seed of sin is passed through Eve from Adam. And, the, and everyone in humanity has received the seed of sin with one exception, the one born of a virgin, because he couldn't receive the seed because Jesus' father was the Holy Spirit. Okay? You see why that virgin birth matters? So Jesus is not, is not born a sinner like all the rest of us. Therefore, he doesn't have to sin. It's not, he's not enslaved to sin when he's born. Now, he still has to resist temptation. He still has the battles. Matthew 4, we see he is in the wilderness after 40 days of fasting, and Satan comes up and starts tempting him with the same three temptations, pleasing to the eye, good for food, gain, good for gaining wisdom, pride of life. And Jesus responds as we should respond with Scripture, with Scripture, with Scripture, the Word of God, because he doesn't, he, the Word of God is not undermined in his mind. He knows it's trustworthy, true, and authoritative. And that's the example that he gives us. This is how we are to respond to temptation with the word of God. Whether we say it out loud or whether we think it, it should move us to stand our ground and say no to the one who is tempting us. Okay, we're tempted by at least we're kind of three categories. We're tempted when Satan or his demons are invo actively involved. I'm not saying that happens a lot. I'm just saying it happens. We're tempted with the philosophies of the world that have been infected with the, the, the lies that have been perpetuated over history. And we're, we're uh, tempted by the flesh. That is our carnal nature, even though we're saved by sin, but saved from sin through Jesus Christ and his blood that nature still hangs around and pulls us back. Until we go home, we still have this battle going on in our, it's that, that temptation to do what I, 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 I feel like I want to do what I don't want to do, and I don't do what I should do. That, that whole tug of war that we see Paul talk about in Romans 7. Okay, that's, that's that battle. All of those are different ways that we are tempted to give in to temptation, to, to give in to sin. Okay, remembering temptation is not the sin. It's the battle. Okay, how do you fight the battle? Well, Jesus fought the battle with Scripture. He fought the battle with fasting. He fought the battle with faith. He, he rested in God's provision and God's word and, and God's, uh, he had fully relied in that God knew better and he was going to trust him and take him at his word. Okay. When we give in to temptation, we are believing the lie that either God is not good or we're forgetting. We're believing that God's word is not always true because this sounds really true. This other thing sounds, this lie sounds good. And we give in, we give in to it. We don't have to. You do not have to give in. It is not, you might say, well, it's inevitable I'm going to sin. Well, yeah, with that attitude, <laughs> We don't have to give in to sin, to temptation, okay? The scripture says that when we're tempted, God always provides a way out. He always gives us, oh, he will not let us be tempted beyond what we can handle in Christ, okay? Think about that. Think about the things you and I wrestle with temptation-wise. There is no temptation that hits you or me that in the power and grace of God, we can't resist or avoid, when we give in, it's our choice every time, okay? Now, obviously, there are things in your life you can do to cause yourself to be more self-controlled, 
Okay, that's a fruit of the Spirit, but it's also something we can nurture. Um, immersing yourself in the Word of God is going to remind you of the things that need to come to mind. The Holy Spirit can bring that Word of God to mind if you've been reading it and, and praying it and thinking about it on a daily basis. And if you don't ever read Scripture, God's got not much to work with because there's nothing there. So when you need a word from God, it's not that he can't provide it, but you're just not, you're not working with him. You're not believing that his word is that valuable, and you're not investing the time to memorize it, to, to meditate on it, to, to read it, to listen to it, um, and to um, just spend time in it. And so here we are wrestling with these questions. What's the matter with us? The matter with us. What's the matter with us? We give in so easily because we, I mean, we're so quick to doubt God's goodness and God's truth. And we can change that. We can't control a lot of things in life, but we can change how we approach the way we think about God and who he is and what he's done for us, okay? And that's my prayer is that you and I will get to the place where we can do that, okay? I want you to think about this as, as a last thought. Sin has infected creation, and we're all sinners as a result of that. All right? That's why we sin. It's like a blood infection. Okay? It's like a spiritual blood infection that can only be removed through a blood transfusion. Well, if we could get that spiritual blood transfusion, whose blood would we use? Whose blood would be pure from the seed of sin? It's the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. For you and me. God has given us a way out. The question is, will we walk with him so that we get out? Let's pray. Lord, we, um, if we're honest right now, Lord, there's probably some things on our mind that you've brought up that we need to deal with right now. Things that we need to confess right now just in the heart of hearts, just agree with you that what you're pointing out is sinful. It could be a sin that we're speaking, a sin that we're thinking, a sin that we're practicing. It could be a sin of omission even. But you call us to walk with you. And if we walk in step with you, in step with your Holy Spirit, we will not sin because your Spirit will never lead us to a place that is anything less than holy. But, Lord, we admit that the lies of this world are so tempting that we give in. But we don't have to. Lord, I, will, I pray that we would believe we don't have to give in. That we can, like a runner who disciplines themselves to get up and go running another day, like a person who disciplines themselves to not eat a certain food because of, it, of the harm it does, Lord, we can discipline ourselves to be more obedient, but it's still by your grace through faith that is going to get the job done. At the end of the day, we must believe that you will give us what we need to resist the temptations you allow to come our way. Because no temptation has seized us that is not common to man, except what is common to man. And whenever we are tempted, you allow us to have a way out. You provide a way of escape by grace through faith. Lord, I pray we would, we would just put everything we've got on that, that we would rest fully in you to walk a holy, blameless life. I thank you, Lord, that though Adam failed, the second Adam, Jesus, succeeded. And as a result, we have a way out. Thank you for the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Help us to tell others of this great hope because they know we live in a broken world. We all feel it, we all see it, and we all feel powerless to do anything about it. But you did not leave us powerless. You gave us your spirit to empower us to live the life you call us to live fully and faithfully. And I pray that you will empower us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching today. It's our hope that as a result of today that you'll grow in your desire to become the best neighbor ever where you live, work, and play. Uh, we also hope that you'll like and subscribe to the video if that's helpful and maybe even share it with others.
Now, for more information about our church or our online ministry, you can go to gracetoday.net slash contact, and you can leave a comment and tell us how God's working as a result of the ministry that we've been doing or how we can help you if that's if there's a need. Um, that's gracetoday.net slash contact. And finally, if you just want to know more about how to trust and follow Jesus, you can text me. My phone is 843-830-2464. That's 843-830-2464.